Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today, uh, and especially to those who are online and who are visiting with us today. Uh, welcome. And if you want to connect with those folks online, you can do that. The Wi-Fi information is in the front of your bulletin. Today we celebrate the Reformation. We hear about um, King Solomon building the temple um, that his father, had, King David, had wanted to build. Uh, so we'll be doing a number of things. And because it's the fifth Sunday, we will be doing a hymn sing. And choir is going to be leading us. Thank you very much um, in some of the hymns that Martin Luther wrote. Uh, this morning, too, we continue our journey through our stewardship, uh, growing together, and um, Sandy is here to uh, introduce Mike for today's feature. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sandy Miller from the Stewardship Ministry team. And I'm here to introduce the second of our Pledge Drive goals for this year. It's called Growing Congregational Relationships with Technology. So last year, you may recall that we focused on funds to do the Facebook live stream service. We upgraded the computer and the technology we needed for that. So this year, we are looking at getting a dedicated webcam and a speaker microphone that we hook up to the TV. And we use that for people to use Zoom for video conferencing so they can be at home, people can be at church, and they can connect that way. And we also need to digitally store church records. We need to upgrade that system, and we can do that best by paying for a cloud service. So I'm here to introduce Mike Radke, who's going to say a few words about how technology has benefited him at Trinity. Thank you, Sandy, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. The stewardship, stewardship team asked me to share the impact on technology for me personally and with what I see in Trinity. In the past 25 years in my public accounting career, I started working on uh, projects using you know, legal-sized paper and storing things in filing cabinets, and I even asked, you know, do you have a network when I first interviewed? We have fully transitioned now to a full electronic working environment and using digital images and so on. So during the pandemic, having this technology in place and having Zoom and video to communicate with my work team and our clients really had a limited disruption and really was a blessing in that we could continue working and maintain as much normalcy as possible. And we had to think, how do we change? from the ways things we have always done. Trinity has had a similar progression in the adaptation of a technology and most obviously the Facebook streaming and tools like Flocknote to communicate with more people on more consistent and platforms. In the matter of communication, only a small segment of the congregation might know that we have been using Google Drive to help facilitate the church council communications. For a few years now, we've had a centrally located drive site in which we can post and share our various church council reports and ministry team reports. I think this has aided the council volunteers to use our time well uh, when we meet together to give appropriate consideration and preparation uh, as we discern for the council activities. And it has also given us a positive environmental impact in that we're no longer printing off all these reports each month to distribute to the team. Now, an aspect of the Facebook service, which I think has really come, uh, become important to me, is I do feel more connected to the congregation at times during the prayers of intercession. As viewers and congregants type out the names for whom they pray, I do feel more uplifted because those names are visible. I look to respond to each of those petitions with the caring emoji as I care for not only those who need that attention, but for you who are asking for those prayers for your loved ones and friends. And admittedly, in, in church, my Lutheran voice was a mere whisper, uh, so this is uh, helping me come out of my shell uh, in, that, in that same uh, needs for my friends and family. So I do hope that we can support that ministry. For me, it has helped me feel more connected while I'm not even in the building, and that we can find those tools to let our volunteers continue the ministries uh, successfully. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, also today, we're having uh, our trick or treat with the city um, at 5:30 to 7:30 out front here. So if you want to dress up in your favorite Halloween costume and come on over and help us um, pass out candy, we'll also have a candle table for All Saints Day and Day of the Dead for um, lighting a candle in memory of somebody that um, has passed. So um, come and join us uh, this evening for that. Should be a lot of fun. Please stand as we begin with our call to worship. How beautiful are the places where you dwell, O Lord. How can I Happy are those who find their strength in you. You may be seated for the, the hymn story. So today we are going to uh, sing a number of hymns written by Martin Luther, and a lot of his hymns, if not all of them, um, show this progression in his own faith transformation from this fear of God and fear of his own sinfulness and inadequacy to the transformation of discovering God's grace in scripture and how that freed up uh, his faith and his life um, to um, serve others and uh, proclaim the gospel. Um, a lot of his hymns also reflect the things that were going on in that time in Europe in the 1500s. There were a lot of tumultuous things going on. Uh, not unlike today, we may be in our own reformation of sorts today. Uh, Europe in the 1500s struggled with uh, the Ottoman Empire and experienced war with them. There was, of course, the religious and theological conflict between uh, the Roman Catholic Church and reformers like Luther, Wesley, Calvin, Zwingli. These reformers became known as protesters. Hence, our term Protestant, uh, protesting against what they um, thought um, the church was teaching at that time that was not um, the grace of God. Luther never set out to start another church. He wanted to reform the church that he was a part of. He was a priest. He was a teacher. Um, he probably would not appreciate that we have a Lutheran church named after him. But what was crucial for Luther was the realization in reading and studying scripture that we are saved by God's grace and not by anything that we do. He struggled mightily with his own sinfulness, his dark side, his missing of the mark of what God wanted for him and for all people. But this good news of God's grace that God came in Jesus to save, not to condemn, was so liberating and so transforming for him that he could only stand firm in that new understanding of who God was and who he was because of what God had done. And people struggle with the same things today. We mess up, we're broken, we don't think we're worthy, we think we're inadequate, we've done things we'd rather not admit, but our connection with God is based on grace and love, not on what we've done. And that's our connection with one another as well. So we're going to sing A Mighty Fortress, which is based on Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength. It's number 504 in the hymn books. Um, it is the story of this foe that we face in the world, this old satanic foe who wears us down and manipulates us and tries to get us to, uh, distracts us from God, tries to get us away from God. And as we sing through the verses, you'll see the progression from acknowledging this um, satanic foe that comes after us to Jesus Christ as our champion and how God overcomes uh, the evil in the world. So, A Mighty Fortress, number 504. 
stand as you're able. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Mighty Lord, the splendor of Solomon's temple cannot compare to the majesty of your heart. Show your heart of grace in this place so that our hearts might be open to becoming like yours and that we might worship you with joy and gratitude. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite Patty to read our scripture. As Solomon acknowledges in his prayer, God cannot be contained in buildings or temples. However, a temple helps the people of Israel focus on God's activity in their lives. Churches function the same way today. Churches are a place of community, a place of focus and centering on God's presence and activity in our lives. However, God's mission is never contained by or within the building. The first reading is from 1 Kings. Now King Hiram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. 
for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to my father David, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the, mount, in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the ark. So they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel, who had assembled before him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, in the inner sanctuary of the house, and in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. They are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had placed there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he, will dwell, he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. The word of the Lord. Our next hymn is Out of the Depths I Cry to You, number 600. This hymn, Martin Luther based on his favorite psalm, which was 130. In his own struggle with his feelings of inadequacy and sinfulness, it is an apt hymn for what he and many of us experience in our own lives. With God, there is always new life that comes out of death. So out of the depths of despair, rise the songs of praise and thanks for God's liberating gift of grace. This hymn was sung at Luther's funeral. In verse 3, Luther prays that the cross of Christ be inscribed on our temples, not a building temple, but our bodily temples, this temple. Just as Solomon acknowledged that God cannot be contained in a building, we acknowledge that we become the temple of God's presence in a world crying from the depths of its own distress. We then bear the hope of Christ into the world. Number 600.
Jesus has just overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. Jesus quotes scripture to acknowledge that the temple should be focused on God and be welcoming of all people. The, the religious authorities want to know what sign will prove this. For Jesus, the sign is his death and resurrection, but the religious leaders fail to see this. They are focusing on the building and not on the places of God's activity in the world, namely Jesus. Second reading is from 2 John, verses 19 to 21. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, Alyssa is going to uh, show us uh, one of the things that Martin Luther created to teach us about our faith. If uh, there are children in the back who want to see, feel free to come on up and sit in the aisle or sit in the pew. And if you can't see, feel free to move so you can. And there will be a bit of participation at the end, so prepare yourselves for that. Uh, so as Pastor said, I'm Alyssa, and I am going to do a little Godly Play style story. Godly Play is an interactive uh, Bible story time that we're beginning to incorporate here at Trinity, um, and you'll be hearing about it more next week as well. Um, but for right now... Um, I'm going to do it up here. It's going to be about this big. If you can't see it, don't worry. I will have it out in the narthex after worship so you can get an up-close view. You can play with the pieces. Um, and I have a couple of handout things you can take home with you as well. There's even a coloring sheet for all of you adults to enjoy. Yeah, we got plenty of space. The church tells time with color. We have had many, many weeks of the green time, the great growing season of the church year, the time after Pentecost. And in a few weeks, we will enter into a new color, a new season. It will be Advent, a time of hopeful waiting, a time of the color blue, a deep blue like the sky just before dawn as we hopefully wait for the sun to rise. It's not quite time for blue yet, but today is also not a green day. Today is a red day, and red is a very special color in our church year. It only comes up a few times. And I see many of you know that today is a red day because you are wearing red. Good job. We wear red as a reminder of the Holy Spirit and the fires of Pentecost. That first birthday when the church as we know it was born and came into being. We remembered that birthday of the church back in May, and now we remember a different kind of spirit-filled birthday, a rebirthday of the church, when the old ways that had gone astray were reformed, recreated, remade, when ideas were reignited and renewed with God's love. And today is Reformation Sunday. And as we've been hearing in the stories for the hymns, there's a lot that was going on during the Reformation and a lot of ideas that were changing. Martin Luther was one of the people leading the Reformation over 500 years ago. And he questioned the practices of the church and wondered how they could do better. He saw the problems with how people were talking about God. 
He saw church leaders taking advantage of others, telling them that they had to pay money to get into heaven, taking money from people and wasting it on fancy things instead of helping others. And he saw that that had kind of left what the Bible said, and he wanted to return to the biblical ways and what the Bible said about God's love. He wanted to remind people of what God's love really means. So he taught that there is nothing we need to do to earn God's love. There's nothing we can do to earn God's love. Because as the Bible says, we are saved and loved through God's grace alone, which we know through our faith. And he wanted to help people understand what being connected to God forever was really like. So Martin Luther wrote many, many things to teach people about the Bible. He wrote things to help parents teach their children. We still use Martin Luther's small catechism um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that and confirmation uh, and church. So he wrote letters to convince church leaders to change their ways. He gave speeches. He posted signs. He wrote hymns like the ones we're singing today. But that was not quite enough. Sometimes all of those words were too complicated. They got in the way and weren't necessary. So he worked with a friend to make something very simple, something that required no reading or no writing to understand. They created an image, a seal, to summarize their theology, their understanding of God, like this. Around the whole thing is a golden ring. The circle is round. It has no end. The blessedness in heaven lasts forever and has no end. God's love and forgiveness go on forever, without limit. The glory of God is exquisite. It's beyond all earthly joy, and possessions, and wealth. Gold is the most precious, valuable metal, far beyond all others. So we use it a lot for that symbolism. God's love is the most precious, the most special, and important thing ever, and it surrounds all else. A field of sky blue reminds us of bright, clear, happy days. It's a color of joy. God's love is always joyful and peaceful in a way we can't even fully understand. We hope for sunny days with clear skies so that we can go outside and do fun things. We know that the weather isn't always how we want it to be, but we hope for the good things. We hope for God's promises, too, even though we don't fully understand them. We know that God always keeps promises, promises of love and protection, even in the saddest times. Our hopeful joy, guided by spirit and faith, is just the beginning of what God has in store for us. Now, the seal is often called Luther's rose. The rose is a symbol of joy, peace, comfort, beauty, and friendship.
Our faith in God makes us joyful in a way that only God's love can. This is not an ordinary red rose. It's a rare white rose, something a little different. Because faith gives peace and joy that is a little bit different from what the ordinary world gives. For Martin Luther, white was a color of angels and holy things. Like white light holds all the colors of the rainbow, God's love holds all that we need. The green leaves remind us of our ever-growing and ever-changing, reforming faith, like the great green growing seasons in church. all, All of this joy and comfort and peace comes from faith, faith that we hold deep in our hearts. Every person has a heart. And we are each part of this forever love and joy and peace from God. The heart is always red because it is always alive. Even when our bodies are no longer living, we are still part of God's family held in God's love. And finally, At the center of the heart is a cross. At the center of our church is a cross. The cross is a sign of pain, a sign of sadness and fear, death, a tool of corruption. But here, the cross is not killing the heart. It keeps it alive always red. Faith in the one who is crucified is at the center of it all. The bad things cannot hide the good things from God. And with Jesus' example of God's great love at the center of our lives, our hearts and our minds, we can know that even when we feel that sadness, when we see that corruption, when we fear the worst, we are always loved by God forever, no matter what, without having to do anything to earn it or deserve it. And we can act accordingly, sharing that amazing love with others. So now is the part I warned you about, for I'm going to ask you to participate a little bit. Um, In godly play, we have a time of wondering. It's an open-ended discussion. It's a little bit different from what you're probably used to, where people ask questions and expect an answer, and there's a right answer and a wrong answer. There are no right answers. There are no wrong answers. Uh, I'm going to say a thing that I wonder. I invite you to shout out an answer. You can raise your hand if that's more comfortable. You can write it on your bulletin. You can whisper it to the person next to you. If you're on uh, our Facebook stream, you can type it in the comments. It is up to you. So I wonder if you have noticed the Luther's Rose anywhere before. Anybody? Silence is okay too. Uh, Last night, someone mentioned that they have seen it in a lot of Lutheran publications. Um, There's also a lot of stained glass windows that feature the Luther Rose. I wonder which part of the story is your favorite today. (laughs) 
The whole part? All right. Anyone else? The gold. What do you like about the gold? Yeah. Anyone else? I wonder which part of the story might be the most important for us today. Or might be most important for you personally right now. if there's any part that we could take out and still have all that we need. No? Mm. I wonder if there's anything that we could add or change to help us understand more. I wonder if you were going to make something like this to summarize your beliefs. What colors and shapes might you use? Later on, if you grab one of the coloring sheets, I invite you to use the back of it to create your own seal of faith, your own summary of theology. Ah. Purple is an amazing color that God made. Oops. I need to just go like that. All right. I wonder why Martin Luther decided to do all of this, why he challenged how things were why he took those steps, put so much effort into all of those writings. Hmm. The church was corrupt. Uh-huh. The church was corrupt, for those of you who couldn't hear that. Ah, so that others can know the transformation that he experienced. Yeah. yeah, there was a disconnect between the everyday people and the people who were leading and were using Latin all of the time. And he wanted everyday people to be able to experience it in the same way. I wonder if the work of the Reformation is done or if there's still more recreating and renewing left to do. I wonder what you would question or change about the church today? What faith practices or beliefs you might challenge? If you had to, write 95 theses and put them on a door somewhere. Yeah. If we give you some homework, maybe. What might you challenge? What might you want to see reformed and recreated into something new or something old? I wonder how this story might help us or might connect to the changes and the challenges that we have encountered during the pandemic. We need to get more people into the church. Ah, 
I'll get more people into the church. Anyone else? Well, I encourage you to continue thinking and wondering. And like I said, this will be on the easel in the narthex after worship, so you can get a close-up experience and uh, ask me any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, that was very good. Our next hymn is number, actually it's number 268, not 265, 268. A Christmas hymn from heaven above. Luther wrote this hymn for his family's celebration of Christmas Eve. How many of you use this at your Christmas Eve family celebration? Okay, maybe this year, huh? Using an old Garland song, Luther penned this 15-verse hymn to tell his family the story of Jesus' birth and the incredible gift of grace given by God to the world. We are not going to sing all 15 verses. We're going to sing 1, 3, 8, and 12. 1, 3, 8, and 12. You can stand as you're able. don't have any families here today. We had um, some last night who presented to their children their Bibles. Um, But as a community of faith, we promise to support them in their faith. So in the bulletin, you have um, a response there for the community. So um, let's uh, make that commitment to our young people. As your community of faith, we promise to pray for you and help nurture you in receiving God's grace into your lives. May God's blessing go with you. Amen. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. We pray for all who long for a word of truth and for the radical grace that flows from the cross and empty tomb. Inspire congregations as well as our own to freely and boldly proclaim your love for all people with persistence and hope. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. 
We pray for all who long for healing in mind, body, or spirit, especially Ray, Melody, James, Carolyn, Barb, David, Anne, Paul, Jim, and all those we name aloud in our hearts or in the comments. Strengthen hospitals, clinics, counseling centers, nursing homes, and recovery centers to be holy spaces of renewal that all might live the abundant life you intend. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who seek to grow in faith and love of you. Guide teaching and learning in confirmation, small groups, Sunday school, youth groups, schools, seminaries, universities, and conversations. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for all the saints and reformers who have gone before us, who dwell in your holy habitation. Give us courage through their example to challenge unjust systems and work toward life-giving reformation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands. Through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please take a moment and share a word of God's peace with one another. Does everybody have their communion elements? Anybody who does not? Choir can turn around, move to a pew, however you'd like to do that. On this Reformation Sunday, we have heard again the story of your grace, O oh God, and compassion for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Our children have received your word in their new Bibles. We have sung your story in the hymns of Martin Luther, and we now receive your gifts in this bread and wine and juice, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We remember that on the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus sat at a meal with his disciples. He took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup. He blessed it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood, a new covenant poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. At this time, you can take your prepackaged elements or your elements at home and take that first layer off, and you'll find the wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you. <coughs> then take off that second layer. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace and peace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you grow the seeds of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy 
bearing witness to the abundance of your love. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is number 594. It's not one that we sing very often, um, but it is the first congregational hymn that Martin Luther wrote. It begins with the reality that we are broken, sinful people who are bound by the chains of this reality and suffer the consequences of our sin. The hymn then moves forward into the wonder of God's grace and compassion for us, his incarnation in Jesus Christ, and his willingness to free us from the bondage we experience. This hymn portrays Luther's idea that we are sinner and saint at the same time. But in the end, we are free, free indeed. Number 594, we're going to sing one, two, three, seven, and eight. <clears throat> God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. 
Our last hymn, Lord, Keep Us Steadfast in Your Word, is probably one of Luther's best known. Remember all those things we mentioned at the beginning that were going on in Luther's world? It's clear in this hymn that he felt like he was surrounded by enemies, enemies who would try to take God's kingdom away from his son, Jesus. We face enemies in our own world. Individualism, the quest for material possessions and wealth, the exploitation of human beings for gain, the oppression and discrimination of people we deem less than us. This <coughs> hymn is as relevant today as it was 500 years ago. As we sing, we ask God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to keep us steadfast in his word of compassion and grace. Number 517. Thank you. 